Thank you, Amira. And um, thank you, Amira and Sezen um, and the whole team at SALT, uh, first and foremost for your amazing hard work in organizing this fantastic and stimulating conference and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I should just say, uh, so I'm, I'm coming from Scotland, uh, joining you there in Turkey and all over. Um, and it has, we've been plagued with awful storms. So the hailstones have just started clattering, making an awful noise. I've put my headphones on. So please do let me know. And they're not the best. So let me know if the audio has been affected by that. But hopefully the hail won't um, interrupt us. Um, so yes, as Amira uh, introduced, I was asked to contribute something of an epilogue um, to bring together some of the issues and ideas that have been raised over these last two days. And I don't know about you, but it does feel already quite a long time ago that we um, heard uh, from our first speaker yesterday. Um, and this literary device of the epilogue it tends to be used um, at the end of a text or a novel to reveal previously undisclosed information or perhaps to emphasize key lessons or morals of a story. But unlike an author of a novel, sadly, I have no prior or additional or undisclosed revelations to share. I am literally bringing up the rear. Um, but this position, now let me just see if I can, here we are. This position, um, uh, we can uh, maybe pick up on the performance convention of the coda, which seems apt in this um, performance art uh, conference. Again, um, as Amira said, this translated from the Italian as tale. Um, although as we've gone on, this uh, kind of structure has become more of um, a call and response as Rebecca Schneider um, has introduced for us already where um, one of our amazing speakers has said something and I've been writing copious notes and responses and it's triggered more thoughts and lines of inquiry for me. So please um, forgive potentially a somewhat um, disjointed uh, overview and, and thinking about some of the issues that we've talked about and that have been raised over the last few days. So this uh, musical term and its symbol denotes the concluding section of composition, which according to musicologist and composer Mark Devoto is generally based on extensions or re-elaborations of thematic material previously heard. So as such, I do not seek to provide conclusions but simply to reflect on some of these critical offerings and potentially suggest some extensions as platforms for future melodies to be made. Um, these might take the form of re-elaborations or also known as recapitulations. And we'll try to share some of, as they say, the copious thre threads of thought um, and inspiration that have been prompted by um, these wonderful speakers. So then we will continue on to the coda, to that little sign there, to riff off some of what's already been discussed and to briefly discuss and introduce some of the ways in which I'm currently working in and thinking about the archive and sustaining um, or re-elaborating on expanded art practices. So let's go back to that little sign um, and 
to identify some of these significant issues or themes. And let's start with this aspect of funding and resources. So this already has been segued beautifully um, from Essa's talk about the need for funding and support um, and all the constraints that potentially can hamper the performance, uh, re-performance, re-enactments, we'll come on to that, of um, this art form. Um, and the question is, raised, how are artists to create, perform, engage, collaborate, and those charged with um, or who are taking on the task of archiving that or um, trying to enable some sort of um, afterlife of that performance, how are they to um, in working with this expanded free form if scripts and scores have to be submitted, for example, to um, funding bodies and authorities before an event takes place. And we saw this very, um, in, in a very striking way, way back um, at the beginning of our first day with Chong Dai Vo's um, really powerful presentation um, and, and the exploration of Joseph Nyang, and forgive my pronunciation, um, of his, his artworks and um, the, what can happen when funding is removed and, um, and when artists also have to rely on that source of funding um, from government agencies. Now, some lines of comparison could tentatively be drawn with the context in which I'm working. So while a different temporally and culturally different context, the current requirements of the funding bodies in the UK and Europe, as I'm sure elsewhere, necessitate the inclusion of detailed plans, itineraries and itemized budgets as important parts of funding applications. To veer from them in any significant way could lead to the removal of that grant. Or for example, um, an uh, inability to, or, or kind of barriers that might be put up to the delivering of certain outcomes, which has been the case um, for many artists that uh, I have worked with recently because of COVID and some have had their funding removed because outcomes couldn't be delivered. Now these are necessary safeguards to try to guarantee the appropriate use of taxpayers or lottery players money but it does raise real issues for artists whose creative practices and processes are not scripted or preemptive or, have tang uh, or, or, or don't have tangible outcomes. Um, as a researcher whose academic background is primarily in conservation issues of contemporary art, I've been stepping further into the field of social practice art that I'll, I'll speak a little more about later. And due to the nature and context of their practice, social practice artists would tend to think of themselves as co-authors of the projects that they initiate, but because their collaborators may not yet be known, whether from a local community, specific group collective, or potentially vulnerable individuals who should remain anonymous, particularly for those artists working um, within the health sector, or for example, in, in social prescribing that's being rolled out in force uh, in the UK at the moment. They're compelled to set in place structures and objectives and intended outcomes that really should be impossible to predict if collaborative methodologies are embodied to any meaningful extent. This disparity between artists' practices and funding infrastructure does need to be addressed and and um, also this need for 
um, validation of such creative practices. And this was an important um, aspect and potential outcomes of a recent project um, from Network to Mesh Work, Validation for Social Practice Art and Artists in the UK. Um, and the report um, is available online that was only published just in 2020 there, um, suggesting some of the potential ways in which uh, artists working in this um, engaged, a uh, socially engaged form should receive validation and um, ways in which that might happen. And in order to then apply for further funding to be able to, to work uh, that through. And I'm, I'm sure we will come back to uh, hopefully all, if not many of these issues that have been, that I've identified as, as being um, thread through many of the presentations um, today and yesterday. But another one um, I would suggest is this aspect of collecting and the commodification of performance art um, or live art. And this call um, for validation prompts that a questioning of extant processes and structures of collecting and promotion. And I love uh, Kai Shimoto's notion yesterday of the Bhutto Tourist Information Center. Um, I love the, the generosity in which she spoke about the way that she connects people and points them in the direction of resources and information that they might be interested in, in order to promote Bhutto dance. Um, and how can we, in, in a similar way, with that kind of hospitality, how can we um, promote and promote access and validation of these kinds of um, kind of expanded art practices? And also Professor Wanatabi explained that this approach to the archive as that of an active and living archive. So with this liveness, the question was raised, how do we preserve the process? To move away from the archive as this repository of memories to a site of encounter, to something generative. And so I've kind of got wobbly arrows between those two points there that going back and forth, because rather than this, uh, as Rebecca talked about, I'm trying to move away from this linear um, temporal understanding and <clears throat> um, uh, of both memory and the, the archive but that it can be this live site of, um, of generation and creativity. How to resist the commodification of the process through the collecting of documents. Um, and, and one way of ensuring transmission rather than simply collecting, um, it was suggested through pedagogy and the exchange um, between the Bhutto teacher and student. This picks up on something that Simge mentioned in her talk, this urge to survive. Our human need not only to present, but to collect, to hold on to keepsakes, of the past to solidify a tangible connection. And I have David Lowenthal's voice ringing in my head with that. But as um, Simge said, and, and I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing here. She said, you can capture the motions, but that doesn't mean you capture the emotions, the emotions of that performance. This notion of the immaterial and um, the emotive 
is something that uh, I've explored previously in relation to knowledge transfer and the artist's voice in contemporary art conservation. How to understand further the tacit information bound up in an artwork that's not reliant on physical form, particularly in a conservation context where um, traditional conservation has been so reliant on um, uh, as I think Re Rebecca was, was talking about that conversation with Hannah Hurling, um, the conservation object. We still talk about it as the conservation object. And so what we're often left with then are remains. And Rebecca has um, written about this beautifully elsewhere and, and, and um, I'm grateful for you for, for bringing that up again today um, and expanding on that. Of what we also could think of as fragments of that performance um, of the event of that moment or um, what's been referred to as the leftovers over the last few days. So in this admirable desire not to lose any traces of that ephemeral moment of that performance for the sake of generational transference, we hold on to warehouses full of these remains. Asimge generously shared some of those images of the warehouse of some of the, the props and relics and material debris from the performances there. And that's not an uncommon image. And actually it looked much tidier than many of the storehouses that I have seen. But also, as, as Essa um, alluded to in, in her presentation just before mine, that these resources to store, to digitize, to reperform, to redo, all cost money and all can be very resource heavy. And not only that, um, but time consuming. Um, as, as you mentioned, Essa, the, the time and um, that it takes each individual involved in that redoing um, to be dedicated to that is, um, can be very draining of resources. So again, coming back to the question of how do we preserve the process? Do we build more remain storehouses? Um, do we may, uh, build more, more warehouses in order to be able to store all these items? I think this is not exactly helpful in our ongoing um, move towards sustainability. But how about digitizing everything? And there has been this um, recurrent question in the Q&A about access to digital or online archives. And as um, this question kept coming up. I was reminded of this piece by John Wilde, um, who is based in England, in London. Um, and his recent project that was um, uh, it took place just before the first lockdown called Dark Fiber Network Drift. And it shows us, I think, really um, powerfully the tangible footprint and presence of the cloud, the ephemeral, that, um, as the name suggests, that level of um, information and data that happens to be um, whirring around in the air somewhere, but actually the, the physical um, and sizable presence of that cloud in everyday life. And this work, um, John Wilde and various other participants um, from the community walked around um, the dark fibre network of, of London, particularly in the East End of London or in Tower Hamlets, um, where he is based. And you can see um, a, a black and white picture there of one of the um, network hubs, um, if, if that's the right word, that houses some of that um, exchange 
And then there were various kind of performative happenings that happened along the way using um, some technology, some participants being really quite um, moved and unsettled and being able to pick up some conversations um, from telephone calls, um, from Zoom uh, meetings um, on this network um, that we think is so closed, but also um, ephemeral. So I just thought I'd put in that slide to show just when, when we're talking about the in digitizing these archives, just the impact, um, the physical impact of that, questioning whether this digitization is actually the answer. Is this sustainable, both in terms of human time and power um, um, or energy, as it were, but um, also in terms of our responsibility in this um, climate, uh, climate crisis. So another suggestion potentially in um, trying to navigate this uh, archiving of performance art was to collect the re-performance rights, as Simge suggested with um, the performance complete incomplete in a collector's house. Would it be enough just to acquire um, the script, the score, or purely just the rights to re-perform that? But as soon as we bring up the notion of, of rights, um, I, I don't know about you, but I certainly think about um, the disastrous outcome of the exchange between Panza and Judd um, when we venture into that language of contract law, which is something that uh, theorists such as Martha Buskirk have written so um, powerfully about. Do we want to um, step out into this new language and this new structure of contract law? And actually in relation, uh, in relation to social practice art and much of this, um, these performances that we've heard about over the last few days, this um, contract law is a capitalist framework which seems to go against the very um, practice of, of much of these creative forms. And this is where I and, and many others are turning to the commons as a means of process and collaboration. We don't have time to discuss this here. We can always talk more about it in the questions and hopefully our time for discussion at the end of today, but it offers an alternative framework to practice and authorship or co-authorship, collaboration and ownership, which um, we're thinking about here in relation to collection and commodification. But it still doesn't provide answers to the problem of archiving and documenting performance and live art. Not least those performances that could be described as activist or political, that challenge systems and regimes and that operate by its very nature independently, as shown powerfully um, by Bajana's paper yesterday in the context of post-Yugoslavia. Um, and with that, we have reached this coda sign. And as I bring some um, extensions to some of these main themes, and I'm sure there are many more that others might want to bring out in our discussion time that you might have, have picked up on over the last few days, it's worth very briefly touching on some of the ways in which the continuation or sustainability, or I think some others have talked about stewardship, but also problematized that of performance and live art, the way in which that's been conceptualized um, in recent years. So that takes us to the issue of re. Um, and of course, these are only a handful of terms that are or have been used. Um, and some of these I've taken um, from uh, Buzzkirk Jones and Jones's article from Art Forum, The Year in Re, 
um, that has a really expansive list of the re um, device. Some of these examples have been taken um, or were given um, as part of that article. Um, and some others um, I merely suggest as examples. Um, and all, at least at times, are interchangeable. Um, and we'll, we'll just work through this very briefly to, to give us an idea, because some of these terms have already been mentioned over the last few days. Sometimes these terms are used interchangeably um, and do have uh, particular meanings and uses and implications. And I'm afraid we might not um, get to the nub of each one um, in this short time. But it's helpful to, to start to think about um, this device of reenactment, to reenact a performance, um, which has a, a, a term that has been certainly used over the last few days, and indeed this piece as well, um, Yoko Ono's cut piece. The reenactment. Um, according to Jennifer Allen in her catalogue essay for the 2005 exhibition, Life Once More, Forms of Reenactment in Contemporary Art, talks about the reenactment searching for a lost totality. There's a sense that in reenacting this um, performance that has once been, there's a, a desire to create some sort of wholeness, a bringing together of those fragments, whether that be documentation, whether that be um, the, the kind of traces of that embodiment into a new body, literally that jumping of bodies uh, or between bodies or from bodies, um, as Rebecca mentioned um, before. But what's the difference then between performing a script or score and a reenactment? And this is something that um, various scholars have, have um, tried to uh, think about, particularly actually in relation to, to Yokono's piece there. And um, I think this piece and the aspect of reenactment also will bring us later on to think about the aspect of absence, which um, has been surprisingly and um, wonderfully something that has connected a number of the presentations today. And indeed, I had planned to also mention absence um, and uh, when I'm, I'm talking about real elaboration. So this is um, another major theme that I hope we can come back to um, at, uh, in the coda um, at the end with these discussions as well. Not only um, Heike talking about the absence, the physical absence of Yoko ono in Cardiff and Wales, um, and also Robert talking about the absence of um, Warhol um, in Gorogska's um, piece. Um, so we'll come back to this idea of absence. Another um, device then we could talk about is to reanimate, the, re the reanimation of artworks. Um, for example, uh, uh, still here from uh, one of the <clears throat> students from Concordia University who um, were, they described it as reanimating a selection of Solowitz wall drawings at um, FOFA Gallery at Concordia University with um, uh, Solowitz assistant, Anthony Sansota, back in, in 2013. So it indicates the persistent importance of conceptualism to all of the art world concepts of redoing historical work. And I've put that in, in brackets of the inanimate for you, Rebecca, um, because um, 
when talking about um, the animate and inanimate and that space between the intra, to use the, that, um, what's the term, the, the prefix um, from new materialism, that um, agency that moves off of individual materiality into that materiality's intra-actions, its witnesses, its trajectories. Um, and um, that sense of, of the, the gesture that jumps, I love that phrase, Rebecca, that is handed over and across. Um, so in that, that term, to reanimate, first of all, it suggests that there is an animation that might be missing, that there might be um, aliveness that might be missing, um, or that would be per perhaps the kind of um, etymo etymological kind of understanding of, of, of how that could be understood. Um, and the sense of animating, bringing a sense of liveness, of movement almost, um, of agency to that performance um, to bring um, a, a, a form of um, kind of a re-embodiment, a re, a re living almost of that, and wh which is why I might problematize the use of the word reanimate for this project that I have um, used as an illustration there. Could that actually be uh, thought of more as um, uh, an enactment from a script, for example, from a score, which we know um, Solowit used for his wall drawings often. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to end up getting excited and overexcited and, and talking too much about each one of these. I just wanted to show um, the breadth of understanding and the use of these words. So another one is the restaging um, and turning to dance. In, in this example, uh, Lucinda Child's extensive archives um, and this dance workbook produced by the Pew Centre for Arts and Heritage that documents her creative practice. Um, and the archive, again, to um, echo what has been raised by some of our speakers today, her archive was called um, by Bill Bissell, the director of performance there, as a living archive, that it's about transmission to establish a living connection um, with dancers dancing. Um, and actually, I've, I, that um, I think speaks directly to what um, Kei Shimoto and Professor Wanatabi were talking about in their um, mentioning of the, the live and the living archive. And again, um, the device of um, teaching and pedagogy um, and that tacit transference of knowledge from teacher to student dancer um, is very tangible in that example. Um, we can also talk about um, the reiteration of performance. And this phrase is used a lot and has, is very, I think of it as a very heavy term um, because it is um, so theoretically rich and dense. Um, but if we think of it, um, for example, in relation to Tino Segal's constructed situations um, and this um, constructed situation is, this is so contemporary um, by Tino Segal, 2004. Um, and these are different instances. So we could think of a re-instance as well, but these are potentially reiterations of that. Um, and again, coming back to that idea of the gesture, that gestures can primarily be these iterable techniques, as Carrie Nolan says, um, and then um, one iteration could be understood in total temporal isolation from subsequent iterations. Um, and, uh, and she talks about that in relation to, um, or forgive me, I'll 
step back. These iterable techniques, our very own Rebecca Schneider talks about and, and brilliantly talked today about the hand and the healing or waving um, that was performed, reiterated today. And that these iterations jump time, space, and jumping between bodies, um, that the gesture becomes reiterated. In this case, the practice of um, the three museum guards entering a room in the museum and um, yelling, oh, this is so contemporary, and dancing around um, the visitors, almost corralling them into the space, um, that each iteration is, um, is a jump, has, but also has an interval. And that the, that, um, the gesture themselves has this reiteration. And the responsibility of that, um, the next performer of that iteration to engage, to respond, to um, generate something from that first or initial um, iteration and to riff off that. We can also think of um, reconstitution. And this might be thought to have more of a, a physical presence as well. And we might think of um, Olaf Arles and, and Monique Rosings um, ice blocks here, um, or ice watch, it's called, that have various um, reconstitutions where 12 large blocks of ice cast off from Greenland ice sheet are harvested from a fjord outside Nuuk and um, presented in a clock formation in a prominent public space. And the first constitution or installation of this was in Copenhagen um, to mark the publication of the UN's IPCC's fifth assessment report on climate change. The second took place in Paris on the occasion of the UN Climate Conference COP21. And the third um, in uh, December uh, 2018 to January 2019 at two locations in London. Now this reconstitution involves not only the reconstitution of ice, because the ice necessarily and fundamentally melts on in each location and so needs to be reconstituted, replaced um, in each instance. But the works also reconstituted, um, for example, in the Paris, I um, wonder if I can do this. I'm just going to share um, uh, I don't know if you can see a man yes. standing yeah, in we, front of the we can see it. Yes. brilliant. Thank you. I, I, I might not have time to play this, but I'm um, just to show you. Um, in 2015, choreographer Steen Kerner, um, again, forgive my pronunciation, who's an expert in street dance and slow motion movement, performed, in fact, maybe I can do it while I'm talking. Um, he performed um, the sound is too loud, it's okay. Um, he performed this quiet intervention in the circle of these 12 blocks um, to draw attention to the, the melting of Arctic ice. And I love that there are also children um, that are interacting and intervening um, 
with these sculptures that people came in and kissed the um, the ice pieces and interacted with it. But in in reconstituting this work also as a performance, um, it, it's again jumping between bodies and between artworks, and I love that generative aspect of that. And I'll go back to there. And last but not least, um, and certainly not least, um, in that there are still many more to talk about, but this aspect of reperformance. And even in describing these, I have used them interchangeably. It's, it's almost hard not to. Um, Robert. C. Morgan suggests that maybe the art of the future will forgo the necessity of what he calls the necessity of spunk in favour of blankness. And when he talks about this aspect of spunk, um, it, I, was um, I was reminded of this when I heard um, uh, the uh, I've forgotten now who 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 said it, but the um, the conveyance of emotion and not just motion. Um, so this um, energy, this something that goes beyond this intangibility that goes beyond the physical. Um, how are we to stop? Um, a blankness of this performance, of any re-performance that might have. And so again, we have that question, do we really need to save all the objects or actions and documents so that they can be instantly programmed for re-performance in the future? And that was a question that Morgan himself asked, and that is a question that has been coming up again and again over these last few days, do we really need to save all of these objects, actions and documents? Um, and um, Peggy Fallon would scorn the notion of reperformance, um, suggesting that, that reperformance betrays and lessens the promise of its own ontology, suggesting that the um, disappearance of performance is fundamental to its ontology, to its very nature. And this element of disappearance um, in relation to ontology has been questioned by many, but um, particularly I'm thinking of Philip Auslander suggesting that mediatization and technical reproduction, so we could think of as the, the document or a mediation, um, or actually remediation, as Heike um, referred to, could that also be characterized by disappearance? It's not necessarily only the sphere of performance and live art, but potentially this mediatization and technical reproduction become themselves through disappearance, he says. They are in that process of becoming by disappearing. It's not exclusive quality of live performance, suggesting that analog archives should be digitized, something that we've talked about a lot over the last few days, as well as the digital archive being transferred to fresh media um, every three to five years, potentially, and um, that migration so that we have access to that um, as we continue on in time. So this notion of liveness, experience, interaction, intraaction, what, how are we to understand? Uh, I'll pause there for a second, just so that um, you can have reference to those, where those images came from. How are we to understand this notion of liveness and um, mediation of the live, particularly um, at this moment of time with the impact of the pandemic and lockdown. And this is something I hope we'll come back to in discussions. Now we've talked about 
live art as well as performance art and what makes it live? Icelander challenges this liveness um, and in doing that he cites um, Nick Caldry's terms online liveness and group liveness, this inter or intra action that can happen both online um, in terms of social pro, uh, co-presence on a variety of scales made possible by the internet. Thank you, Zoom, um, and uh, also the live streaming to through YouTube, I think, today. Um, and this, this underlying infrastructure that enables a certain amount of liveness that we have, I think, become, I certainly have become increasingly reliant upon and also enjoying to an extent to be able to join with you in Turkey um, from uh, Scotland right now. But also this group liveness, the, the liveness of a mobile group of friends who are in continuation, uh, continual contact via mobile phones, for example. It can be a moving liveness. It can be a changing, continuing, morphing um, liveness um, in, that includes a certain amount of movement as well. Um, but as part of that um, liveness and that feedback between um, the human and non-human, the, the user and the technology, and we could even think about those relationships um, that are forged through AI and human uh, machine learning, um, thinking of Alexa, or not that uh, we have it in this house yet, but the... Um, that sense of liveness, of being responded to, of that call and response again. So as I kind of bring this coda to an end in order to share that space of the coda with, um, with the rest of you and, and encourage some discussion um, between us, I want to explore this notion of, of liveness with uh, the work of an artist I've spoken about before. And I think what prompted um, Cezanne and the team uh, at SALT to uh, invite me today um, is this work by um, Aileen Campbell as Jane Edwards and Geoffrey Rush. Um, as a trained chorister, Campbell sings a well-known piece by Vivaldi, accompanied live by strings and a harpsichord while bouncing on a trampoline for 20 minutes, which is the duration of the aria. And it should be said that this um, was not the first um, iteration of uh, this piece, um, but that it took different forms and different happenings um, in previous locations, including um, as a student in California, when she, she actually was challenged um, by one of her fellow students in a crit about how difficult it actually was to do, which is why then this iteration um, became 20 minutes. So it was a repeating um, of the aria. The piece and the title refer to this dramatic moment towards the end of the 1996 film Shine, directed by Scott Hicks, when the character of pianist David Helfgott, played by Geoffrey Rush, is bouncing on a trampoline while listening to this aria through headphones. The audience were able to choose whether to see this live in the flesh, as it were, from this particular perspective, or relayed in real time, streamed, now I would say, to cinema one in the Dundee Contemporary Arts in the same building. Um, I might move on just now, if we have time, I can always come back and show you uh, a, a video of um, recording of that and an edited video that was put together afterwards and is on the Eureka um, archive site. But Campbell deliberately chose not to privilege the live performance over the transmitted projection. And in doing so, she chooses, uh, she makes you choose between two very different experiences, the both essentially containing the same material. Is there any difference? Does it matter? It's intended to draw the viewer's attention 
to the disembodied nature of sound in cinema uh, and to the, the way in which we might be quite forgiving of imperfections in performance and live performance, as it were, but not in the recorded work, which, of course, when Jeffrey Rush is, is jumping on the trampoline, he's listening to a recording that is um, perfected in the studio. So decisions have to be made and responded to that call and response, both by the artist, the artist becoming coming under increasing strain in this metronomic bouncing, having to choose, particularly as we're um, heading towards the 20 minutes of how to manage her breathing patterns, um, when to sacrifice um, some length or duration of a note for the sake of pitch. And it really is incredible to see um, just she remains in tune throughout and just becomes slightly breathless. So she must have been training a long time. But also the decisions made um, by the viewer, um, which uh, kind of mediation in which to, to view this work, um, gaining different perspectives. Um, and again, I'm reminded of, of the, um, the artist responding to monuments um, that was spoken about in the Asia art archives, um, moving up onto the scaffolding to view these monuments, gaining different perspectives. So viewing Aileen Campbell jumping from above, um, from the side, the motion of the camera as well, rather than being in the static position. Um, also something that I haven't thought about before also was the musicians um, and having to repeat and repeat and repeat the piece again and again. We might think it's an endurance work for them, although, you know, professional musicians are practicing for hours a day, but the decisions that they might have to make um, in that practice form of when is it um, practice, when is it performance and is there that um, that skippage and that slippage, I should say, between the two. In relation to this, I'm wondering whether we could even learn something from the field of intangible heritage for, for tracing that intangible. And there's been incredible research projects, for example, this one, I Treasures, that I, um, I know that, that UCL was one partner as, as part of that, which is um, why I became aware of this project, but it's a European funded collaborative research project um, where this incredible new technology is used to record these um, dances for one an example on the left, but also um, the sonic and physical um, movement and vibrations um, and actions of a beatboxer um, on the, the right there. So these visualization tools, but also sensor uh, monit monitoring um, and kind of learning um, context in order to, to do that and pass on, again, coming back to this transference. But the thinking about what is it that we are transferring? Is this going to be able to, um, to teach an, um, the next generation of dancers, of um, beatboxers, um, and there are various other um, art forms that were um, recorded and, and documented in order to be engaged with. So this is this is my last slide, um, and uh, in questioning that liveness and what constitutes liveness. I can't help but come back to um, some thinking and, and research that I've been um, involved with in the last year or so. Um, and this notion of the spectral presence. And I was made aware of this through um, a, a reading group that I'm part of called Cultures of Species Revival, founded by Dr. Sarah Bezan. Um, when I started to think about conservation as a counter extinction um, practice and a, a culture of counter um, extinction. And I learned um, fr from a really great paper that um, Shane uh, McCorstein and Bill Adams wrote on spectral geographies of biodiversity con 
uh, conservation. So we are a very varied group in this reading group from geographers and scientists um, and social scientists. And uh, I'm one of the token art historians. Um, but this picture of the spectral presence, I think is really helpful for us, particularly as, as we kind of, I, I bring this to a close and, close and open up to think more about this aspect of absence um, is really important. Um, the spectral presence being a form of being in the world that is uncanny and is at risk of vanishing. It's in that vulnerable position um, that this um, ghosting takes place. Um, and spectral geographers are interested in how this kind of, it's referred to as this haunting manifests troubling presences through memories, materials and landscapes. So this sounds very familiar to some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, that haunting, and I'm quoting from their paper now, haunting does not necessarily provide proof that something or somebody dead exists or persists. Rather, it reveals the feeling, coming back to those emotions again, the feeling that it is missing. The absence of presence can coexist with the presence of absence. In other words, absence is experienced and can only arise in lived experience. And so the importance then of the fact that this absence is both relational and actionable. Um, bringing up the, this language of shadows um, and the play of shadows, invoking imagination and the use of this device of imagination that I want to suggest could be helpful in starting to re-elaborate on some of these performances. And we might even think of that absence of Yoko Ono, for example, in, in Cardiff, as Heike talked about, her absence actually sent action ripples into those shadows and also had very tangible consequences with the audience getting their their money back um, and I'm sure had implications for the organization um, and we saw a picture of that check being ripped up. So this um, aspect of the imagination um, and uh, a telling of a narrative, or as, as Rebecca Snyder said, the, the performance of telling it again is, is a beautiful um, illustration there, that there's, there's this potential generative path for sustaining, re-elaborating the jumping bodies um, or, or that, that that call and response, the call of the performer and the response of the preserver as that means of preservation. And the social art library is something that is um, an interactive digital space, just to, to finish on, that um, holds a permanent collection of custom content created, commissioned by AXIS, an archive collection of projects submitted by artists, um, and has an artist librarian in residence program and is a digital archive of current thinking around the intersection between art and, and society. And they say that they believe that stories of social practice are too important to be lost. And it's in these stories, I would suggest um, that we can move away from this triumphal arch that Rebecca started with. Sorry, Rebecca, I seem to be referring to your paper a lot, but it's, it's kind of, I keep coming back to it and I love that um, uh, so we're moving away from that kind of rigidity stasis that colonial thinking towards um, the besideness that withness um, the those lateral leakages as you said and and I would add also potentially those stories those re-elaborations those rifts those reimaginings that give presence to those elusive specters so as um, I've been thinking about some of, of these presentations, and, and forgive me to, to those presenters who um, came later on today, uh, I was madly trying to, to write up and include some, some thoughts that were prompted um, 
from, from that, but uh, obviously slightly less time to prepare that. Um, so I hope that you'll um, engage um, with some more discussion um, as, in fact, yeah, um, as we move on. Um, but I've also just added some questions because I know that um, the organizing team would like um, this also to be a, a discursive time as well, to, to bring the conference to a close by, um, by thinking through some of these questions um, together. So some of the questions that were also raised um, uh, for me um, and potentially for others then um, is again, what does this liveness or performance look like in the wake of the pandemic? What does documenting and archiving look like? Again, tentatively saying post-pandemic um, in, in um, parentheses. And coming back to this notion of absence, how can or should we embrace absence? And, and finally, I, I just moved by um, Robert's presentation, does absence actually have to involve pain? Um, is an, an interesting question. So please do um, ask any questions in the Q&A or in the chat, um, or if there's any anything that you um, that has struck you about um, some of what has been talked about in the last few days or anything that um, you'd like me to clarify as well from my talk. I'm aware it was a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour. Um, um, it, it doesn't need to be a question. It can be, a, um, for, for anyone, it can be a, a musing. It can be more riffing. Um, we can go back to the, the DSL coda and keep going. Um, if there's any more themes that you feel might have come up over the last few days or, or important issues, I mean, to step away from the analogy rather than talking about themes and recapitulation, you know, let's talk about some real issues and trying to archive and um, dare I say care for this art form, art practice. Um, are there anything, maybe even there's anything that has left anyone frustrated, uh, at a loss. Um, Rebecca, could you answer your question about whether you think um, absence, uh, it was a terrific um, invocation of absence in a bunch of papers, whether absence requires pain, I'm interested in what you would say to that. Yeah, I did the old rhetorical question, didn't I? I should have been prepared to answer it. Um, I think I was hoping not, that it, that it didn't have to involve pain, but potentially that it might also suggest that we don't have to stay in the pain, but that it might be part of the process of dealing with absence. Um, you know, those, those five stages of grief or whether it has to be physical pain, um, you know, in, in some of the really powerful artworks that we have seen examples of, particularly um, activist artworks. Um, and when artists really put themselves to the absolute limit, um, and to be honest, I, I do find those, some of those performances really uncomfortable. Um, and so maybe it's good to stay in the pain for a little bit to work out why uh, I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, but I, yeah, I just don't like seeing people in pain. Um, but the, the, there's always going to be some pain with loss. Uh, and whether it's pain, whether it's grief, anger, or some of those other factors, denial, um, But, but I think um, an important part of addressing that is um, awareness and acknowledgement that that absence and loss exists and whether we're at what point, so something I'm battling with at the moment is at what point can we just let things go? Um, and this has come up a lot recently in terms of, of a conference that I'm 
um, involved with on sustaining art sustainability. Um, at what point does this massive physical and digital footprint that we are, um, you know, responsible for, at what point do we just say that's enough? Let's stop. Let's stop keeping things. Let's let things have that moment and then and then move to the shadows. Do you have any thoughts on, on that or anyone else maybe? I mean, I may have come back to a like previous uh, comment on uh, the panelist chat, but uh, since we are actually doing this conference online through Zoom, so which actually uh, give us all a new playground or let's say performance ground um, uh, like uh, a new and uh, refreshing one but like also uh, like uh, we don't know the limits we don't know who the audience is like and like so what is this new phase with like this performances online this conference online and um, dance and theater companies doing their, um, you know, pieces online. So um, maybe like to like jump into an another conversation, it might be good to how, uh, like, what do you think about this new arena or like this new uh, playground or stage that we have? Um, we actually live broadcast uh, the biennial this year for the first time for our audiences everywhere. And we had a very, very good response um, to that. So it really is an amazing, um, you know, key to access for people and for disabled people as well. People who couldn't go to the beach and watch a Shy Keith performance could watch it at home. So, I, you know, I think that that's, yeah, there is the issue, the environmental issue of storage and and all of those things, but um, on our scale, it's pretty small. So I think that it's you know huge advantage, um, and also for a conference like this, you know, to be broadcast, it's a huge advantage to students everywhere. And uh, so for us, it was a definite uh, moment finally to push us towards broadcasting, which we'd been talking about for years, and for producing content for TV and broadcast, and again, then further extenuating that out to larger audiences, which I feel is a pressing issue for us, you know, is, is the voice of the artist in society and what we're sort of bombarded with online and social media and the garbage that we watch, uh, that this is an opportunity to really um, put our put our foot down, as it were, and really demand to be seen. That's what I would say. To pick up on on that essay as well, the kind of um, that line of thinking around sustainability and footprint and access, you know, because how do we measure the impact of hundreds odd people flying across the world compared to that um, materiality of of storage um, and even you know online storage? So. Um, I feel like I'm constantly calculating and, and playing things off over each other and um, and trying to, to, to think through that and the impact of that. Um, but I think that aspect of access is really important, but that, again, there's, there's always, always compromise. So though for some that access through online engagement is increased those with um physical uh, disabilities um or for example i was i actually did start to listen um using the interpretation the trans live translation for a little while in turkish just so i think it's amazing um you know so we have then all of these um resources to hand um, that can aid with um, with accessibility, but then there's this the other issues of access in terms of um, 
uh, internet speed, um, which is a real problem or that, as I mentioned, there's been lots of storms recently, so my internet has been coming and going, so miraculously it's working to, tonight, but um, so we've got internet access speed. Um, also those um, who are not, I guess, um, a smaller or a bit of a minority, but having um, not as fluent with um, online platforms still and those kind of visitors. Um, and also time zones, you know, if we're, if we're not all in the same place at the same time, um, sometimes that access can be difficult or you um, have to make the effort. Maybe this is like the, um, I remember, you know, doing your medium studies uh, masters thinking about um, that process of gentrification and having to make that journey to those artist studios for, uh, you know, in the 60s that was out with the white cube um, and that that journey was part of the process. So maybe the having to get up at five o'clock in the morning to to get to a, a talk online from a different part of the world, maybe that's part of that journey and that pilgrimage to engage with um, that liveness. And so maybe it just manifests itself differently it's another iteration isn't it uh, Rebecca you really like uh, gave us the most the richest coda ever I believe uh, and uh, I believe the audience is really uh, exhausted at the moment. I believe we all are. And you just like uh, followed uh, all the presentations uh, throughout the like two days. Uh, so uh, thank you for such a uh, like really um, rich and also like fantastic uh, closing presentation. And um, I want to just uh, like thank you uh, all on behalf of SALT team and on behalf of the audience who is here. I want to thank you all uh, who performed uh, today with us the stage record our archive performance. And uh, that will be accessible on SALT YouTube ch channel for future visits. And uh, I think like if like I would say the conference, like if um, you would like want me to choose a tag for this conference, it would be forever unfinished uh, because there's so much to talk about. Uh, and uh, following the instructions of Rebecca Schneider uh, earlier on her presentation, uh, I wave to the future audiences. And if you are still there with me, maybe you can open your cameras and you can wave uh, for the future uh, yeah, audience. Thank you for this performance, for performing this conference with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for an excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.